So a couple of months ago, I went to Smashing Conference in LA. Uh, it was put on by Smashing Media, which is a company that runs a website called Smashing Magazine that does a lot of kind of web design um, stuff. So the, the conference was two days. It was really enlightening. It was really nice to go and kind of interact and interface with a lot of other people that are in this field. For those of you that don't know or are maybe new, I'm working on the Git Kraken team right now doing user interface design and user experience design. Um, so this is going to be kind of a talk about design a little bit and kind of my uh, thoughts and takeaways from that conference. So the general theme was, was web design and, and kind of addressing this complexity of managing design in, a, in the kind of digital online world where everything can change so much. Um, and trying to find a balance between the performance of websites and the user experience and, and the pure aesthetics. So there was this kind of um, like broad spectrum. And this quote was kind of in my head the entire time that I was there. This is a really awesome quote from Dieter Rams, who was a designer in the 50s, 60s for Braun. Um, and he has these 10 principles of great design. And one of them is good design is as little design as possible, less but better. And this kind of resonated throughout all of the speakers' um, talks. So I want to kind of touch on why uh, that was and go over four themes that I kind of found that cover the spectrum from really highly technical considering design all the way to very aesthetic um, design. So there are the things that I noticed where there's performance, design and systems, design and process, and design and creativity. So this is going from like very technical, um, talking about the performance of things to just like pure art. So for design and performance, um, they had a speaker who was really amazing. His name was Steven Soders. He was former chief Perform Chief of Performance at Yahoo and Head Performance Engineer at Google. He's currently working at a company called Speed Curve that does like front-end performance monitoring for, for websites. Um, and he has this quote, the impact of design on performance needs to be considered from the start. So as important as design is, it's really important to kind of take into consideration from the very beginning how that's going to affect the performance of what you're building, whether it's a website or an application. Um, just because that performance is going to be what users initially experience, and if they have a bad experience with performance, it doesn't matter how good it looks, it's gonna, they're not going to use it. And he had a few suggestions concerning the marriage of this kind of design and performance. Um, one of them is what are the most critical design elements? So not having kind of super, super, superfluous design for design's sake, but really designing for a purpose and, and only putting things in that are going to actually help the application or the site um, do what it does better. And a really common theme at this conference also was the, the idea of prototyping over just doing mock-ups. So usually um, when you're kind of designing out something, you'll draw it up, you'll sketch it, you'll use Photoshop to do something to de kind of design. And everyone talked about the importance of prototypes, which is essentially like a working model of what you're doing so that teams of designers and developers can communicate better. And, and have a better idea of what the final product will be like rather than just continuously designing and designing and designing without having anything that works. Um, and that also helps with performance because then you can kind of monitor the, the kind of evolution of your product as you're building it and kind of measure the performance. So measuring performance from the start and monitoring through every iteration of the design and build process is really important. Um, they use a couple of things at um, on the software that they use where they can basically set a performance budget for how something works and then use in-page reminders during the development process so you can see if you like hit a violation. Like if you want to say I want everything to load in this many milliseconds or I want um, this page to load a certain amount of time, they will set kind of these metrics and use tools that pop up if while you're using the product you go over one of those um, settings that you've set. So you can kind of monitor how the performance is evolving with the development of the product instead of just like develop, 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 and then okay, now we have to like figure out how to make this work a little bit better. Um, so those are some of the really good key uh, points that he made. Considering performance, there's also this idea of perceived performance, which is when a user is using your application or your page, you can make them feel like something's working fast, even if technically it's not working very fast. 
So um, this quote by Stephen Sow, who has this awesome book called Designing and Engineering Time, said that performance improvements should be faster than 20% to be noticeable by users. And 20% increase improvement is kind of hard to hit constantly and consistently. So using this idea of perceived performance, we can do little tricks and things to make the user feel like something is working faster than it actually is. One of those examples is the Facebook um, kind of content stream. Like they'll load something there that shows that something is coming rather than just having a blank page while all this content loads into the page. So kind of giving visual cues, giving the user an idea that something is happening, you're not just like left out in space, um, and that you kind of have an understanding of what's coming even though there's not really any data there yet. So design and systems uh, was one of the other themes that I kind of took away from this. And Vitaly Friedman, who is the, um, he's the editor-in-chief of Smashing Magazine, who put on the conference, had this quote, design systems, not pages. And this is really kind of gaining a lot of momentum in like the design and web development community where um, they're, they're using this term called atomic design, where you basically design everything as the, the smallest component of your interface and then grow it out from that rather than taking a big snapshot of what you think you want it to look like and designing down. Um, so this idea of atomic design has been kind of perpetuated by someone named Brad Frost who has a, a lot of really good thoughts on it and he's kind of visualized this, this process of atomic design. And kind of follows along with chemistry where you have the like basic building block which is called the atom which would be the general, like the, the lowest level elements on a page. So like a form label, a form input, and a button. These are all like individual atoms that you design without even understanding necessarily what they're gonna fit into, but understanding how they operate as individuals. Then you can take those atoms and make molecules. So if you took a form label, an input, and a button, now you have this, this, this molecule, this item that someone will be able to interact with. And then it just kind of gr keeps growing from there. An organism would be a group of these molecules, so like a page header with an icon and a nav bar, and then that form input. It just kind of like starts building organically, and you have the, these parts and pieces that help you stay consistent throughout the interface. And that's really what um, this atomic design is all about, is keeping things consistent so that you have um, users are familiar with, with what they're using and don't have a billion different types of inputs and buttons and things like that. Patty Tolland was also a really good speaker here. She's a design content strategist at this group called the Filament Group. They were very famous for redesigning the Boston Globe's website. Um, and they used this, this um, process called progressive enhancement where they basically boiled everything down to just the content and then added design onto that dependent on the device that needed to display the content. So I don't know if anyone can see what this is right here, but this is an Apple Newton. Does anyone know what those are? So those are like super old, like I don't think anyone uses them, but they basically proved that even on a really old antiquated piece of technology, they could load the Boston Globe website and still have a decent user experience. Someone could still navigate the articles and, and get the content that they needed without all of the flash and the stuff that you might get on a desktop or a mobile phone or, a, or an iPad. So this idea of like boiling everything down to like the lowest common denominator and then building it up from there. Uh, that's just one of these themes that kind of resonated throughout the entire conference. She, the filament group that she worked for has this kind of hierarchy and if you're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs which is basically like this um, pyramid of things that are most um, the like biggest necessity at the bottom going up to the top. And we get back to this idea of speed being the most important thing. So performance um, being the, the number one thing. A couple of good points she made about speed were that users can detect even a 250 millisecond difference between different competing sites load times. And that can be huge if someone starts to recognize that difference and decides, well, I don't want to wait a quarter of a second on this site, I'll go to this other place. Um, so taking account of speed and performance is super important. Access is um, getting back to the idea that any user on any device should be able to get the content um, and design shouldn't get in the way of that. They should be able to access what they're trying to get without being bogged down by um, decoration. 
And then scale, this kind of had a little bit more to do with responsive design, which again is, is adapting designs to different devices, uh, but basically just keeping really simple scaling options. And then style is at the very top. So really, everything else has to be more important than the design, and the design should end up being the, the thing that really makes it work well, that makes an impression on the people that are using it. Um, you should never start with the style and then try to figure everything else out um, ahead of time. So process, another one of the themes that were really important. Um, they talked about the process of redesigning interfaces. So if you have something that's existing and you're working to make it better, they use something called an interface inventory, which is essentially going through what you already have taking it apart and taking screenshots of all of the individual elements, you can visually compare how um, all of those elements look and see if there's like some cohesion there. This is a, an example um, from, again, Brad Frost works a lot on this inventory, uh, interface inventory. This is like a really quick example he did of just pulling all of the buttons from one of his banking websites. So this is one site, and this is every type of button that they use in there. So when you do an inventory, um, interface inventory, you can kind of step back and see, okay, why do we have like three different arrow types and different font types and different shadows and gradients? Like this is giving a really inconsistent experience to the user when they're trying to figure out what is a button. Um, in contrast, a really good example was Etsy's interface inventory, where this is kind of like what they have for buttons. And it's because they have a really good style guide that everyone follows. And they use a pattern library that says, okay, here's what a button looks like on the Etsy site so that everything's consistent and users don't feel like they're being jolted every time they go to another page. Um, Trent Walton was awesome. He works at this little three-man design development firm in Austin, Texas. Um, and he had some really good insights on working in small teams with designers and developers together. Um, he talked about collaborating a lot between design and development. So rather than having these kind of separate units of we're designers over here and we're developers over here, working to build something together ultimately makes better products and is a more efficient process because you're able to monitor performance, you're able to make sure that the design is working as you go and you don't have these kind of big roadblocks that you run into when one group goes off and does their own thing on their own. Uh, prototyping again was a huge thing that he brought up. Um, doing sketches should only inform what goes into the prototype, and then showing up with finished designs, so putting tons of time into a design that doesn't work, it just takes time, potential hurt feelings if someone's like, oh, look at like, my shiny design, and everyone's like, well, that really sucks, so go do it again. Um, so this idea of just like constant iteration and um, design from that standpoint. Bear with me, I'm running a little over. Um, so creativity, this was um, the total opposite end of the spectrum from worrying about performance and usability and really just like how do these applications make people feel. Um, Andrew Clark had a, a great quote, process, technique, and tools are not equal to creativity and emotion. And he was really focusing on this like creative part, this art involved in designing applications and websites. And he used an analogy for Mad Men, if anyone watches Mad Men, um, where they in the agency, if no one knows what Mad Men is, it's about an advertising agency. Um, computers are starting to become really big, so they basically wipe out their creative department and plop a big IBM mainframe in there because they're using these IBM mainframes to try to like, predict what people want in the advertising world. And he uses this as a, as a kind of symbol of over-trust of technology versus creativity and like the, you know, the people that are true artists. I mean, he had some really good thoughts about that. He had a question, are research and testing taking away our ability to take risks? So are we like putting too much stock into like all of this testing and, and not really thinking about what is like hitting the core of people and how they feel about our apps and our websites? Um, not to smother ideas with practicality. So to basically like let ideas fester for a little bit rather than just having an idea and deciding whether it's good or bad and ditching it. Um, and then tempering your use of data with hunches. So again, like mixing that feel in with the like really technical support of data. Um, all of this, I think, kind of boils down to this um, idea of the three levels of design, which is uh, brought up in a book called The Design of Everything, Everyday Things by Dan Mor Norman. It's really more of like a product design book, but I read an interesting article on Medium where a guy talked about how this really applies to web and application design. So these three 
um, levels of design. There's a visceral level of design, which is this attraction, so like the ooh, shiny, like I really like how this looks, it's very pretty. And the first impression, which is the onboarding process, so how that person feels when they, when they start using that. And then the immediate emotional impact, so like the color, the design, the like lust after this like object that they want to use. Then the second level of design is behavioral. So this is all of the user experience. This is, is it performant? Is it fast? Is it you know, doing exactly what I need it to do? And is it doing what, I, what it says that it's supposed to do? So is it meeting those expectations of the user? And then there's the reflective part of, of design, which is the memories that users make when they use something that they really like that really solves the problem that they want it to do. They're gonna have joy in that and they're going to like keep coming back to use it. They're gonna tell other people to use it too. So that's, that's kind of how I feel about design. Like it's, it's definitely an important part of this entire process, even though it's kind of at the top of the hierarchy behind performance and a lot of other things. It really has, um, really has an impact on users, so it shouldn't be forgotten. So some of my reflections on the entire um, conference, consider the impact of design on performance, increase collaboration between design and development, Design systems, not pages, so getting back to that atomic design. And then prototype early and often. And be conscious of those three levels of design. And then as a final note, uh, there was a, one of the vendors at the conference was Shopify, and they gave me this awesome t-shirt that says, design is the heart of everything that we do. And I think that's a really important philosophy to adapt in any company, especially considering how important design is to users that are going to want to love using what you're making. Um, so that, that was really awesome. I got to talk with those people for a little while and I'm really happy to be bringing those ideas here and continuing that on with Gate Kraken and Access Talk. Kind of fostering that idea of design importance here. Any questions?